good to see you this evening, and stand with me, please, if you would. Stephanie, would you ask us? Lord, we praise and thank you for this opportunity that we have to come to your house. We pray that you'll help us, Lord, to worship and to praise you as best we can, and help us to listen and to learn more about you. In thy name I pray. Amen. Amen. Alright, turn around, shake hands, we'll start with Jesus set me free, why should I be mad? Jesus set me free.
and blessing and honor and glory be done.
word once again and then uh, share what the Lord has laid upon my heart for this evening. Heavenly Father, I give you thanks and praise, Father, that once again I'm able to gather with my brothers and sisters in the Lord and we together, dear Lord Jesus, are able to worship, to lift up your name and to give you praise and honor and glory for all that you have done. And you continue, dear Lord Jesus, to watch over us. You continue, dear Lord Jesus, to fulfill your promises in your word. And we are so abundantly blessed. And so, God, as we are able to look upon each other and smile and rejoice together, I pray, Father, that you would encourage everyone that's here this evening. Help us to be bound together by your spirit and by your love. And may we, dear Lord, continue to pray, Lord, that you would bring others in to your kingdom. Dear Lord Jesus, that we could look upon new born-again souls and rejoice together with them and encourage others to continue and to also walk in the light as you have given us that light in which we should walk. Tonight, Lord, I thank you for the word that you have laid on my heart. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would deliver that word and that we, Jesus, would gracefully and gladly accept it and take it, dear Lord Jesus, from this place and may it be a part of us so that we, dear Jesus, continue to grow in you. And I thank you and I praise you for your just helping us to grow day by day by day. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to start with a question this evening, and uh, it's to... Uh, provide, uh, of course, an example leading us into the topic that the Lord has uh, sort of put into my heart for this evening. Um, and my question is, um, why do we pray before we eat anything or before we consume anything? Why, why do we do that? And we could probably come up with a, a list of different reasons uh, whether it's to thank the Lord and glorify Him for what He has given us, to remind ourselves of how blessed we are, and we certainly are uh, very, very blessed. And I, for one, have to ask the Lord to keep reminding me of that, uh, because, you know, sometimes small things uh, can get blown out of proportion, and then every once in a while I either have to listen to the news or watch something and recognize just how good I've got it, uh, and then also remember not only the material blessings, but the spiritual blessings. And so we thank the Lord for all of those things, but one of the other reasons that I believe that we need to pray before we consume anything these days is for protection. Um, because uh, it, something can look very good, and something can taste very good, but really we have no idea what's actually in what we are consuming. And so we have to ask the Lord for protection, we have to ask the Lord for wisdom, for knowledge, for discernment, all of these different gifts, so that uh, the things that uh, we consume, which may very well contain poison to our body, um, do not harm us. And so we pray for the Lord's protection. Um, so, our topic this evening isn't so much about poison, but about purity. Um, and the Lord has laid on my heart the importance of the purity of God's Word. And the reason that that's so critical is because um, when somebody tries to poison someone, um, they do so, uh, you know, a good poison, I'm not going from experience here, <laughs> but a good poison uh, I would believe is one, again, that the intended victim doesn't know that they're consuming. So, I mean, if, if you put something in, in some food and it's not good for me and I take a bite and I immediately reject it because it tastes so terrible or it looks so terrible, um, then that's not going to do me much harm because hopefully I haven't consumed enough for that to, to hurt me. But if it's something that's hidden, something that's very subtle, a small thing that doesn't take away from the flavor of what I'm consuming, doesn't change what it looks like, then that's very dangerous to me and to the person that's consuming it. 
And the Word of God is pure. It's pure, and I can say that without any doubt or any hesitation, because I know that the Lord is pure. I know that the Lord is good. I know that everything that comes from God is positive, is good for me, is holy, because the Bible tells me that God is holy. And so the word that we have, God's word, is a pure word. It is unadulterated. It is not in any way um, damaged, but we have an enemy, and that enemy is Satan, the devil, and he works overtime to harm God's people in as many different ways as he possibly can. And one of the ways, and certainly is, um, you know, I think happening a lot in our world today is by poisoning the Word of God, by trying to adjust it, change it, um, adding or taking away, and the Scripture clearly, we're not looking at that verse this evening, but it tells me very clearly in Revelation that that is not to be done, that we are not to add to the Word and we are not to take away from the Word. The only one who has the authority to do that is the author of that Word, and that, of course, is the Lord. So, what Satan likes to do, and we're seeing this, I believe, with the many, many, many different versions of the Bible that are coming out, uh, you know, I think as fast as you can think about it, somebody is coming out with another edition of some sort. Um, what's happening there is that the Word of God, which is powerful, and I believe is always pure, but you have people that are adding or subtracting, taking away things, and, and when they, that happens, in effect, what you're left with in churches or in the hands of people isn't the Word of God at all anymore. It's somebody else's idea. It's somebody else's Word. And that has no power to save. That has no power to change any of us. It does have power, though, to knock people down and to give people, in a sense, false information, false hope, so that they might think that they are consuming something that is good, when in fact, within that, the enemy has hidden something that is very, very damaging. So, God spoke to me about the purity of the Word of God, and how critical it is for us to acknowledge that it is pure, and then to make sure that we are not consuming anything other than God's pure Word. So I was led to this verse in Luke. So turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Because I was thinking about that purification. I was thinking about how God's Word is pure, and what, what do we need to do as God's people? How can we... It's not so much maintaining the purity of God's Word, because I think God's Word does that itself, but it's recognizing what shouldn't be there and making sure that it is removed. How does that happen? That separation, I guess, uh, of the purity of the Word and separating out those things that defile it those things that pollute it. And that led me to this verse that Jesus actually uses to describe how Satan tries to separate us from the Lord. And I'm in Luke chapter 22, and I'm looking at verse 31, and here Jesus is speaking to Simon Peter, and he says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he, he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Now I used that verse 32 a while back. The Lord spoke to me, and I shared with you about that whole idea of being converted and what that means. But now I want to look at this verse 31, and use this idea of sifting uh, to help us to understand that the Word of God is so pure, 
and that we as God's people, in a sense, we can turn this tactic around. Okay, so Satan tries to sift us, all right, to separate us, because that's what sifting does, right? You've got some kind of a screen of some sort, and uh, based on the size of the little holes in the screen, some things fall through, and other things don't, okay? And uh, so Russell and I were today uh, changing some reverse osmosis membranes, and I was explaining to him how those are sort of filters, and it sifts out all of the dissolved solids that are in the water. And I have, just as an aside, told you before that the water here in Cambridge is basically liquid rock. Um, and it, it is full. Uh, I have meters on, on ours in the house because, again, going back to my fish, um, the salt water tanks need zero total dissolved solids. So I basically am trying to purify the water, not for drinking, because that takes too much out, but to the quality of what they might use in a laboratory, where they're looking for something that doesn't contain any minerals or anything like that. And what I do with the salt water is I, I add back into that water a, a mixture that is good for the coral and the fish. But I don't want any of the other garbage. Uh, but so, just to give you an idea, and it probably doesn't mean that much to you, but my total dissolved solids coming into the house before it goes through any kind of filtering is somewhere around 750 or higher at times. And that's really, really hard. There's a lot of junk and minerals in there, etc. Um, and the reverse osmosis membranes were used up. They weren't doing what they were supposed to do anymore. They were taking a lot out. By the time it came through to the other end, we were at about, at one point this morning, I checked it yesterday, it was 180. So it was taking a lot out, but that's still a long way to go to get to zero. And so we changed some filters today, and now it's coming through at about 24. Uh, and then I put it through an additional three different types of filters to get it to zero. All of that to sort of say that and as I was thinking about that, and thinking about how imperfect, how unpure, Im impure, our water is here, and it looks okay, you know, and you might be used to the taste of it, and, and all of those kind of things, uh, but it's not okay. It's got a lot of stuff in it that isn't so great. And, and, uh, and so I was thinking about that, and then I thought, you know, just as I am working so hard in the natural, which means nothing with regards to eternity, to get those things out, so all I'm left with is the pure water, we have to be vigilant. And I don't use that word lightly. Like I'm, We have to be on guard, on guard, on guard, with regards to the enemy wanting to come in and very subtly, very carefully, and in a smooth sort of fashion, trying to change the purity of God's word. And so Satan says, and Jesus says, Satan uses the sifter, right, to try and separate us from the Lord. And I thought, you know, we need to turn that around. We need to turn it around, and we actually have to use the sifter, God's sifter, so that we are separated from the devil. And we want to be that pure Christian and strive like the word of God is pure. We want to work towards being pure and get rid of the 99.9% .9 or 100% of the garbage that Satan is always trying to stick to us, to put in our thoughts and to put in our behavior patterns. Because we want to, you know, the Word of God is our example, right? It's, it's this guide, this target for us that we are supposed to keep looking at. And so we have to be careful. And, you know, we use the King James Version. And we're trusting, in a sense, and we're believing that this version, 
Of all the versions that are out there, people might ask you, why do you use King James? You know, it's hard to understand, uh, you know, etc., etc. They think they'll use those different sort of reasonings. But as far as we know, it is one of, if not the, closest to the original translation because it's based on the original documents. Okay? And the further we get away from that, and this is the problem that we have with all of the different translations today, the further we get away from the original, the greater and greater chance there is that Satan is slipping in things that are not even close to the original meaning. Now, you know when I teach, or when we go through the scripture, I will at, at times refer to the original text, and I, I'll share with you the fact that the Hebrew and Greek, it's hard to translate into English, because one of their words means a whole bunch of different things in different languages. And so you're trying to make sure it, it's all, you know, flows the way it's supposed to, and it works grammatically. And so we're believing, we trust, that when the Bible was commissioned to be translated into English, that the Lord had his hand on those men, and maybe there were women too, I'm not really sure, uh, that, were, that the Lord gave them the knowledge and the ability to translate it so that it's saying what the Lord wants it to say. So as we get further away, the influence of the enemy expands, right? Uh, and he has more and more opportunity. Now, even in the times <coughs> that the disciples were being led by the Lord, we see that Satan wasn't just trying to sift out Simon Peter, but he was trying to sift out all of the, God's people by changing what the Word of God had, in, what God had intended for His Word. So we have these warnings, right? So the Lord led me to a few of these warnings. And when we look at them, we have to understand, and, and I'm always reminded, that this Word is timeless. That's the beauty of the Scripture. Right? It's timeless. What God had His Holy Spirit lead people to write thousands of years ago is still 100% applicable today. And so, again, you can't allow yourself to listen to the lies that Satan promotes where people will say, well, that doesn't apply anymore and society has changed and people have changed, etc. Sort of suggesting, they're suggesting, that we've gotten better. But that is, again, a lie, right, from Satan. Because we can't get better on our own. The only way we are going to get better is if we're saved and we allow the Lord to work on us. And he works on us through his word, by his spirit. And that's why this is so critical, that this does not get changed, that this doesn't get lost in the shuffle, so to speak. So let me give you some verses. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and many of these you'll be uh, you know, likely familiar with, but let's be reminded. 2 Timothy 4, and I'm going to start reading at verse 3, right? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So I read this, and I have to be reminded, okay, this was a letter written thousands of years ago, and even in that time, already the Holy Spirit was warning God's people that there are going to be those people, right, the time, and it, like prior to what I read, I should probably go back, read verses 1 and 2, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, 
at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all unsuffering and doctrine, for the time will come. So there's a prophetic word there, right? The time is going to come. Well, I'm quite sure the time has come long ago, right? Where these people, where people in general, they love to hear things that make them feel good. We all, it, you know, if we're too, totally honest with ourselves, and, and I, I'll just use myself, I prefer to hear things that make me feel good. That, in a sense, um, at least let me think that I'm right. I'm thinking of politicians at the moment. Um, you know, that, that say all kinds of things um, and will, you know, they walk this fine line and they won't say yes and they won't say no and they won't commit to one thing or the other and that's not because they don't have an idea in their head or a brain in their head it's because they don't want to offend anybody they want to be everybody's friend and they want everybody to think that they are their friend okay and so they are these people, they're a good example, of people that will not endure sound doctrine, or I suppose most of the population these days is that way, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And so when people vote, they vote for somebody who has told them what they want to hear. Most people. And, you know, and I suppose as God's people, the, we do a similar thing, right? But we recognize that what we want to hear is what God has to say. Whether that makes us feel comfortable or not isn't going to change what God has to say. But the warning here is that the Word of God, right? We don't want to have teachers. We don't want to have uh, be ourselves that kind of person that says one thing. And you know, if I were to preach, let's let's imagine imagine a, a preacher, a pastor, who depending looks at the audience and says, "Well, I've got a lot of young people here today, so I'll say one thing." And then the next week says, well, there are a lot of seniors here today, so I'll say something else to them, right? But no. No. Our job, just like it says there in verse 2, is preach the word. Live the word, I'll say to you. Be an example of the word. Because we have no right to change it. Because it is pure. And if I attempt to make any change to it, I am defiling that word. And if I preach anything other than what the Bible teaches, what God says, then I'm not teaching God's word at all. I'm just teaching my own thinking. And that's dangerous. Because then not only am I saying I rely on myself, and we know the Bible says the arm of flesh will fail us, but I'm trying to convince you to do the same thing. And no, that's not what we are supposed to do. So there is this danger. And in Galatians, you know, it, it got to the point, if you turn to Galatians chapter 1, where Paul says to the people here, you know, that he is in a, he's very disappointed in a sense. He says in Galatians 1 and verse 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into grace of Christ unto another gospel, right? So, you know, Paul's looking, he's writing back to the Galatians now, and if I say it in my own, you know, paraphrase, I am surprised at how quickly you have forsaken the Word of God. And now you're following some other gospel. And anything that's not God's gospel is a worldly gospel. And if it's worldly, that means it comes from the devil. Oh, people don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that. But that's the truth. Because there are two, there are only two authors. Really. Right? 
There's God who authors a pure word, and there's Satan who is the author of lies and of deception and all of these other things. Anything that's not of God is of the devil. And when we talk about sifting, we want to make sure all of those things are removed and don't become a part of what is pure. Right? Like what comes through to your tap in your house, they say, has gone through a purification system, right? So they've got big plants and they've, they're doing something, right? And so they add this chemical and that chemical and another chemical, and then they say, oh, the water is clean and it's good for you to drink. And I'm not a water specialist in any sense of the word. I'm just saying, I know from my testing, which is very rudimentary, that there's still a lot of stuff in there. And the surprising thing is, and here's the good example, I suppose, if I use what comes out of the tap, everything in my fish tank is going to die. So there's the test, as far as I'm concerned. Like There's the evidence, right? If it's so good coming out of the tap, but I put it in and with some fish and some coral and different things like that, and lo and behold, everything goes belly up. <laughs> so much for the purity of what comes out of the tap. And it's the same thing, you see, that the world will say, well, you know, this version is good, and this thing is good, and you should read this other thing, and this man-made philosophy is good, and this other man's religion is good. And they're all going to the same place. In other words, you can drink from any of the taps, and it's going to be fine. But no, there's only one word that does not lead to destruction, and that's God's word. And so here, you see, Paul is surprised at how quickly the people have forsaken the Lord. And that's because, you see, it's so much easier to follow when somebody's already when saying something to you that you're already doing. If I go into a weight loss, uh, you know, a, a weight management clinic or whatever you want to call it, and I tell all the people they're perfect weight, you don't need to do a thing. Your body is fine. Your heart is strong. Everything is great. Ignore all those other tests. They're all, first of all, going to be very foolish. But some people are going to say, yeah, yeah, I knew it all along. Right? And they're going to trust my word or somebody else's word over a specialist. And God is the only specialist I trust. Because all the rest, and they maybe have a good intentions, or maybe they don't, but my point is, they're all human beings like I am, and we all make mistakes. But God doesn't. And so when God wrote this word, this is the one we have to grab a hold of. But you see, it's so easy for us to slide. There are verses I'm not going to turn to that make it clear that there are false prophets, right? There are false teachers. There are people that after the disciples left the churches and they planted those churches, it wasn't long before others came along and also, you know, they wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted to be famous. They wanted to be the ones controlling and have the power. And so they came in with different philosophies, with this, different Gospels. They said, oh no, you don't have to listen to that. And today they would say, well, times have changed. Well, we don't have to listen to that. Or they'll say something like some different denomination, so to speak, or religions will say, oh, the Holy Spirit, that was for then. But that's not for today. Speaking in tongues? No, 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 that's foolishness. That was only then. That's not for today. Being slain by the Holy Spirit? Oh, that was for then. But we're so, more, so much more sophisticated now. So we don't do that anymore. If you can show me in the Bible where there is an expiration date on the Holy Spirit moving, 
okay, but it's God's Bible. But you can't show me that. And so how can we, how can we say those things are not for today? See, that's just what Satan wants us to believe, wants us to think. Because in some cases, sometimes, and I've testified of this before, when I came here originally, I was scared to death because it was foreign to me. I, I had never experienced anything like that in my entire life. And I thought I was a Christian. But what I was drinking and feeding on had poisons in it because it had removed parts of what the Bible says and the power that God says we can have today. So we have to learn, and I'm not going to preach on, but this of course touches on discernment and all of those different things, but we have to learn that we, God provides us with filters, ways that we can sift out the enemy's things so that all, all that remains is the purity that God wants us to have. And so the Bible refers to things, and again, you uh, won't turn to it, uh, but 1 John chapter 4, if you read that, that's where it talks about trying the spirits. Right? Testing them. Checking them. So I said to you that I knew that the total dissolved solids in my water coming in was a certain number. Well, how do I know that? Well, you have to do a test. Then the next question is, how do you know the test is accurate? And then you have to have some standards, right? You have to have a known entity. So coming from a lab, and then I, obviously you're trusting that, you know, that says this is pure, or this has got so much dissolved solids in it, and so you use your instrument, and you calibrate, right? And I've talked about that as well as, some, as a topic in the past, the, uh, how we have to calibrate ourselves. But we always test according to the Word of God. We always compare everything to what God says. And this is another one of Satan's tricks. And that's why, by creating or having all of these different versions of the Bible, so why do we have a Catholic Bible? Why do we have all these other Bibles? Right? I grew up, I was reading a Lutheran Bible. Why do we have all of these different versions of God's Word specific to certain forms of belief or different denominations? Why? Because those versions all contain something or multiple things in them that tickle the ears and the fancy of the people sitting in those congregations. What I want is the truth. What God's people should always be seeking is the truth. And the only place we find that is in the Word of God. And so we have to go and we look and we go and we you know, we can compare to original texts and we can look at, you know, and there are many people who have studied these things, you know, but we can look and we pray and then we try the spirits. We test those different ideas, philosophies, thoughts, always coming back to how do they line up with the Word of God? Is it pure or is it poison? What's in it? And it would, is this glorifying? Does this line up what the Lord says? You know, I was, I looked then, you know, because the Bible gives us other indicators, I would say. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, for example, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Well, what's the scripture saying there, right? If you are, if we're seeing confusion, and it's coming as a result 
of what somebody says is in the Word of God, I'm sorry. The Bible tells me God is not the author of confusion. And so, if it's creating confusion, then there's a problem somewhere. See, these, these are these indicators. These are these things that we can use as warnings. And the Bible provides them for us so that we're not led astray. Right? In Isaiah chapter 5, a verse that we all know and quote to some extent, Right? In Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Okay? What is, by, what is God saying to us there? Watch out! Right? And so if somebody produces something that they say is God's word, but it's got all these things flipped around, and then, you know, people will say, well, how do you know what's good? Who are you to say? And my answer would have to be, I'm nobody to say. Don't go by what I say. Let's go by what God's Word says. And then you've got to be careful. See, this is the society we live in today. Because they might pull out something, and they say, well, here's, here's the Bible right here. And then we have to say, I'm sorry. What version is that? What's been changed from the original context, from the original text? Is that really a standard that we can go by? Let's go back. Let's go back as far as we can go back. And then, well, I can't understand it. No, it's not that hard to understand. We just have to do a little bit of study, and we have to learn. People have been going and listening to Shakespearean plays forever, and they pay money for that. And they sit in the audience, and they laugh at the jokes, and they cry at the sadness, and then they come out and they say, I can't understand the King James Bible. Wait a minute. That, that makes no sense whatsoever. Okay. It's what you want to do, and people throw that up as a roadblock when really it's no roadblock whatsoever. So our response needs to always be, I come back to the Word of God. I come back to what the Lord has inspired people to write. And I lean on that Word, and I believe in that Word, and I use that, this is my filter. This is my filter with regards to lifestyle, which re with regard to how I interact with other people, this is my filter, okay? And I put whatever I'm planning on doing through the filter. And it's a very fine filter. It has a high, high, high standard so that all of the garbage goes through and only the purest stays on the surface. Okay? And that's the kind of filter that's worth it. What, what good is it? If I gave you a filter and it was just a hole, <laughs> just imagine for a minute. Because I'm going to say, that's really the world's filter. The world's filter is a hula hoop that is completely empty in the middle, and anything they pour into it comes exactly through the other side, and they'll say, look, it's good. That's the world's filter. But that's not how God works. Okay? And His Word is straight, and it's narrow, in the sense that it is righteous, and it will remove those impurities if we use it. And then we have to just make sure that it's staying and always using that pure filter that God has given us. There's a last verse I want to give you. And it relates in a sense to the fact that today, as I said, uh, Russell and I changed the filters on my reverse osmosis unit. You see, because it's not good enough to say, oh, I have water that goes through a reverse osmosis. Well, have you maintained it? Are you taking care of it? 
Have you checked it lately? See, and I hadn't been doing that. You just do the math and you can, I've got sensors on mine so that it measures before and it measures after. And then you can do a little bit of simple math and you can figure out what percentage of the garbage is pulling out. And a good unit should be pulling out you know, over 95 and higher percent of the garbage. But when I did the math yesterday on mine, because I was noticing some problems, it's only pulling out 77%. I said, oh, what good is a reverse osmosis unit if it's not maintained, if it's not being looked after, if it's not pure anymore? So then that led me to this verse, and I close with this in Ephesians 6. And of course, here's where it talks about, you know, the weapons and the armor and all those things. I'm not going to read all of that. I'm just going to read one verse here. And it's in Ephesians chapter 6. And to me, this is how we then clean the filters. Okay? And it is by trusting the Lord. It says in verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. See, you can have a King James version of the Bible. Or you can be learned and, and trained in Hebrew and in Greek. And you can have a Bible that's all in the original text. But without God's Spirit, without His power, without His strength, we know it's only going to be a letter. And in a sense, for me at least, I compare that to a reverse osmosis unit where the filters are all plugged up. And yes, they might have done the job originally, but we haven't taken care of it. And you see, as God's people, the way we take care of things is coming back to the Lord's Spirit. Coming back to His power. Right? So that when I read the Word of God, which I said at the beginning is pure, as God is pure and holy, as I read it, I have to read it with God's Spirit leading and guiding and revealing things to me. Because if I don't read it with God's strength and with God's power and God's might and His leading and His Spirit, then I can still misinterpret. And how does that happen? That happens when my brain decides, oh, that's what that verse means. Well, then you have to ask yourself, did God's Spirit reveal that to you? Or is that what you wanted? See, in a lot of places in society today and in churches today, the interpretation is often what the people want. And then we come back to those verses about the teachers and the people that are spouting gospel, but it's only what the people want to hear because it makes them feel good. And the rest is either ignored or has been twisted so it's no longer what God intended for it to mean. As we move into 2024 and a lot of what the Lord is speaking to me about is about the future it is so critical that we hold on to what is pure and that's this word and it's so important that we ask God to help us to also hold on to God's righteousness to ask God for his purity in our lives not what I want not what I think, but what is the Lord saying and what is He commanding us to do. And that is the road that we need to follow. So stand with me this evening. We're going to pray together and we're going to have our time of prayer. And let us, you know, it, it is, um, I always struggle a little bit because we should always be reflecting, I think. I think reflection is, is healthy in particular, well, it's only healthy if I'm looking at the reflection in the Lord's mirror, spiritual mirror. 
But to do that is something that we should be doing all the time. How am I doing today? How's my walk today? Where could I have been better today? A lot of questions, a lot of self-reflection. And unfortunately, there are certain times of the year where traditionally we do a little bit more of that, right? When really we should be doing it all the time. That's my point. But as we were moving into getting closer to another year, and for me, the Lord is talking about what will the future hold? What does that look like for me? What does that look like for us? What does, what does God intend? What is he, how is he leading and guiding? And I don't know any or all of those answers, but my desire is to make sure that I'm leaning on him, that I'm asking him, that I'm waiting on him, and that those prayers in the last little while have led me to a topic like tonight where it's so critical that we make sure that we are reading and studying and praying and just leaning on the pure Word of God, which really means we're leaning on Him. Because He will see us through. Where He leads, I'll follow. That has to be where we are. So let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank You and I I just pray, dear Lord God, tonight that by your spirit you would help all of us, help everyone that's here, that is, uh, as I've shared some scripture and some examples, Lord, and, and people can think of their own examples and their lives, I'm sure, where the purity of something is so critical and how that purity is achieved and how important it is to fight to maintain it and how easy really it is to lose it. It doesn't take much to make something <coughs> truly, to make something dirty. It doesn't take much to change something from being pure to being less than pure. It just takes a very, very, very small amount of anything. And so, dear Lord God, that, that speaks to my heart. And that speaks to me about how critical it is that Every day I ask you, help me, dear Lord Jesus, to focus on you, on what is pure, to look to the scripture and not to interpret it as I would want it to sound or to be interpreted. But Lord, what are you saying to me? And what, dear Lord, are you speaking to your people? And may we all, dear Lord God, always wait on you and hear only your voice. That's the only voice that counts, is God's voice, and what is he saying? And then truly, where you lead, Lord, help us to say, we will follow. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, and I thank you for those that have come out tonight. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your protection, the people that have been traveling, and Lord, others that are still away. Lord God, bring them home safely, protect them. And may we, dear Lord Jesus, gather together uh, this weekend and moving into a new year. And let us have joy. And let us, dear Lord Jesus, seek after your Holy Spirit to have, dear Lord God, the power and the deliverance, dear Jesus, that you truly wish your people to have. Lead us now in prayer as we pray for those around us that are so less fortunate. Father, they need oh, you. They need, dear Lord God, to give their hearts to you. It's the only answer. It doesn't matter how much money gets thrown at it. It doesn't matter how many people gather together at a conference and decide this thing or that thing. The contracts don't matter. The promises don't matter. All of those things made in the flesh, they will fade away and they will die and they will be gone. And then somebody will come up with some more. But Lord what this world needs, what our community needs, what people in our families need, is your deliverance, your salvation. And dear Lord God, we look and we believe and help us to do what you are asking us to do, Lord God, that others would find you and have that same joy that we have, the same blessings that we have. Be with us as we remember our missionaries 
and those around the world that are in places of conflict, where tonight bombs are flying, where tonight uh, death is happening round about them, destruction is occurring. Lord, in the midst of that, there are your people. And I pray, Lord, you would protect them. And Jesus, let them know that you are there and that your hands are upon them. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.